It is the start of a new day, within this detention facility. The camp comes to life, as residents begin to prepare for their daily activities. Just about everyone in the camp, has specific chores, to do on a daily basis. While some parents have to get their children ready for school, others have regular jobs which include many, administrative, manufacturing, farming, retail, restaurant, and maintenance positions throughout the compound. German women refused to work outside of their own home. Any assignments required of them had to be delivered to the doorstep. So they could work out of the comfort of their cabins. This are probably some of the first instances of telecommuting. Rations for the entire compound would arrive in the early morning hours and were unloaded at a warehouse behind the office of the Department of Supplies and Procurement which supervised the ration in and distribution of food and other supplies. A special formula was used to accurately divide the supplies among the internees based upon the need and size of the families. A general store in the compound would provide all additional household goods or personal needs. These could be purchased with plastic currency, which was earned income from the various jobs and chores within the camp. Outside of the barbed wire fence and on the east side of the enclosure, a few acres of land was set aside and designated for farming vegetables and raising pigs. 50% of the food products consumed in this camp were produced in these fields. Early in the morning, Japanese workers would be herded out, supervised by a white American foreman and with the help of a few camp guards on horseback. They took care of all of the farm crops harvested in these fields. German men would have nothing to do with this kind of labor, and were allowed to man cleaner jobs within the compound. Although, most of these Japanese workers were actually businessmen, doctors, lawyers, financial professionals, and other white-collar workers from Peru. They did not mind doing all the hard field work and ranch work in the scorching heat of South Texas summers. Fresh pork was a good part of the daily diet at the camp. The pigs were well fed and cared for by the keepers. They were vaccinated as required by the health department and provided an endless supply of meat for the butcher shop inside the compound. On the west side of the compound is the main entrance, which is also crawling with activity. In the early morning hours, the mail truck arrives at the main gate. It is then forwarded to the internal security office, where it is carefully examined by various inspectors representing every nationality within the compound. There is no limit to the amount of mail that arrives or leaves the camp. Also arriving is a busload of newcomers. They are the wives and children who have come to join their husbands and fathers. Just off an all-night train ride from New Orleans, they are welcomed by existing residents of the camp and the Girl Scout troops of the compound. After all of their personal items are inspected, some of which may be allowed, while others may not. They are escorted to the special private mess hall, where friendly camp workers provide them with their first meal within the enclosure. Also in the early hours of this Texas morning, we find the milkman on his daily round. There are about 1,500 minor children in the camp, and, therefore, about 2,500 quarts of milk were required each day. The ice delivery man is also out making his rounds. Unlike the milkman, he gets a lot of help in the delivery of this precious cargo. Especially in the scorching summer months. The young men have no problem volunteering to help out with the deliveries. This has to be the coolest job in the entire compound. Plus, they get to eat all the ice that breaks off by the accidental manhandling of the icy blocks. Other important jobs include a community laundry for 4,000 people, plus the hospital. 
This was a huge daily task, that had to be repeated on a daily basis. By the German population of the camp. The Volunteer Fire Department. There was also a textile factory, which would make all kinds of clothing apparel, such as dresses, pants, shirts, jackets, and all kinds of fabric products, like tablecloths, blankets, and most of the needs of the hospital. The clothing store not only had plenty of garment goodies for sale to all residents, but also for any visitor with a pass to the compound. These factories were manned entirely by Japanese workers. German women refused to do this kind of work. Tailor shops would provide handsome tailor-made suits for all special occasions. These suits were also available to staff and visitors. The sales department of the textile factory was always very busy, mostly by Japanese shoppers. Plastic money was used on all purchases. Although German women would not work in this factory, they would surely buy the products. One end of the retail counter provided them with a German salesman to facilitate their purchases. Other important jobs around the camp included the hospital staff. They provided all of the same quality health care as any other full operational hospital outside the compound. In this maternity ward, about 250 new Americans were born in captivity. In the surgery section, an anesthesiologist prepares a patient to go into the knife. There's the chloroform. There was a machine shop that was operated by German workers. Their preferred type of work. They would build a lot of the specialty furniture and custom beds for the facility. The transport maintenance shop was also operated by Germans. Pre-war automobiles and equipment were always in constant need of repair. It is now lunch time around the camp and the officers mess hall is all ready and waiting for them. The cooking staff is all Japanese that speak mostly in Spanish and do not understand English. Does that sound familiar? This is a different mess hall for civilian employees who work at the camp. Signing the log is Mrs. Lee Luntz, a federal high school English teacher and later career teacher with the Crystal City School District. Other civilians in this crowd include other teachers, nurses, members of the administrative staff, and security staff. And a little flirting. Then, there are the schools. The teachers keep the children occupied most of the day. As the day's classes come to an end, all the students are turned loose and all the streets throughout the compound become saturated with children. The end of the school day also marks the end of the work day for a lot of the dedicated workers throughout the compound. Everybody goes home, and families are all together, once again, in the mid-afternoon. After a brief rest at home, it is early evening, and time for competitive games and entertainment at various locations within the facility. Beside a lot of popular international sports, like football, baseball, tennis, and basketball, there are a lot of traditional competitive exhibitions like jiu-jitsu and sumo wrestling. Another popular competitive sport was jousting. A Japanese knight would try to knock another knight down while riding on top of a six-legged, six-armed human horse. All these were mainly Japanese athletes. But what about the Germans, you might ask? You guessed it. They were hanging out at the bars. The evenings were capped off with a nice dip in a large swimming pool at the northeast corner of the facility. 
And so, this is what a day was like, in a separate little world, within the city limits of Crystal City, Texas. Unless they were employed, by the Department of Justice, very few people knew, what was going on, on the other side, of this barbed wire enclosure. 